This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Now you have Cicero. These are all names of systems that solved or achieved human level performance on the game of diplomacy, which uh, for people who don't know, is a popular strategy board game. It was loved by JFK, John F. Kennedy, and Henry Kissinger, and many other big famous people in the decades since. So let's talk about poker and diplomacy today. First poker, what is the game of No Limit Texas Hold'em? And how is it different from chess? Well, No Limit Texas Hold'em poker is the most popular variant of poker in the world. So, you know, you go to a casino, you play, you sit down at the poker table. The game that you're playing is No Limit Texas Hold'em. If you watch movies about poker, like Casino Royale or Rounders, the game that... The aspect is there's no limit to how much you can bet. You know, you in Limit Hold'em, there's like $2 in the pot. You, you, you can only bet like $2. But if you've got $10,000 in front of you, you're always welcome to put $10,000 into the pot. So I got a chance to hang out with uh, Phil Helmuth, who plays all these different variants of poker. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like No Limit rewards crazy versus the other ones rewards more kind of calculated strategy. Or or no, because you're sort of looking from an from an analytic perspective, is, is strategy also rewarded? in No Limit Texas Hold'em? I think both variants reward strategy, but I think what's different about No Limit Hold'em is it, it's it's much easier to get jumpy, you know? You go in there thinking you're gonna lose, you know, you're gonna play for like... <laughs> ...is going to have a material impact on your life, then you're gonna play in a more risk-averse style. You know, if somebody makes a huge bet, you're gonna... If you're playing No Limit Hold'em and somebody makes a huge bet, there might come a point where you're like, this is too much money for me to handle. Like, I can't risk this amount. Uh, and that's what throws a lot of people off. So that's the big difference, I think, between No Limit and Limit. What about on the action side when you're actually making that big bet? That's what I mean by crazy. I was... I was... <laughs> One of the key strategies in poker is to put the other person into an uncomfortable position. And if you're doing that, then you're you're playing poker well. And there's a lot of opportunities to do that in No Limit Hold'em. You know, you can have like $50 in there, you throw in a $1,000 bet. And, um, you know, that's sometimes, if you do it right, it puts the other person in a really tough spot. Now, it's also possible that you make huge mistakes that way. And so it's really easy to lose a lot of money in No Limit Hold'em. If you Um, are you drawn in in part by the beauty of the game itself, AI aside, or is it to you primarily a fascinating problem set for the AI to solve? I'm drawn in by the beauty of the game. Uh, when I, I started playing poker when I was in high school and the idea to me that there is a correct, an objectively correct way of playing poker. And if you could figure out what that is, then you're you know, you're making unlimited money, basically. That's like a really fascinating concept to me. Um, and so I, I was fascinated by the strategy of poker, even when I was like 16 years old. It wasn't until like much later that I actually worked on poker AIs. So there was a sense that you can solve poker, like uh, in the way you can solve chess, for example, or checkers. I believe checkers got solved, right? I yeah, think, checkers, think checkers is completely solved. Op, optimal strategy. Optimal strategy. It's impossible to beat the AI. Yeah, and so in that same way, you could technically solve chess. You could solve chess. You could. In any finite two-player zero-sum game, there is an optimal strategy that if you play it, you are guaranteed to not lose an expectation no matter what your opponent does. And this is kind of a radical concept to a lot of people. to lose an expectation in the long run. Now, the same is true for poker. There exists some strategy, some really complicated strategy, that if you play that, you are guaranteed to not lose money 
in the long run. And I should say, this is for two-player poker. Six-player poker is a different story. Yeah, it's a beautiful, giant mess. When you say in expectation, you're guaranteed not to lose in expectation. What does in expectation mean? Poker is a very high variance game. So you're going to have hands where you win. You're going to have hands where you lose. Even if you're playing the perfect strategy, you can't guarantee that you're going to win every single hand. But if you play for long enough, then you are guaranteed to at least break even and, and in practice probably win. So that's an expectation, the size of your stack, generally speaking. Now, that doesn't include anything about the fact that you can go broke. It doesn't include any of those kinds of normal real-world limitations. You're talking in a in the theoretical world. Uh, what about this, the zero-sum aspect? How big of a constraint is that? How big of a constraint is finite? So finite's not a, a huge constraint. So, I mean, most games that you play are finite in size. Um, it's also true, actually, that there exists this like perfect strategy in many infinite games as well. Technically, the game has to be compact. In non-two-player zero-sum games as well. And by the way, just to clarify what I mean by two-player zero-sum, I mean there's two players, and whatever one player wins, the other player loses. So if we're playing poker and I win $50, that means that you're losing $50. Now, outside of two-player zero-sum... which is like the pleasure you draw from playing the game. And then if you're a professional poker player, if you're exciting, even if you lose, uh, the you know, the money you would get from the attention you get to the sponsors and all that kind of stuff, is that, that would be a fun thing to model to model in. Or does that be, make it sort of super complex to, to include the human factor in its, in its full complexity? Uh, I think you bring up a couple of good points there. So I think a lot of professional poker players, I mean, they get a huge amount of money, not from the actually playing poker, but from the sponsorship. Um, the the chaos, and maybe sometimes you want to be overly aggressive because peop the audience loves that. That'd yeah. be fascinating. I think, I think what you're getting at here is that there's a difference between making an AI that wins a game and an AI that's fun to play with, right? Yeah. Yeah. And or fun to watch. Trying to win. They're, they're playing a different game. They're trying to have personalities. They're trying to be fun and engaging. Um, and that makes for a better game. Yeah. And we also talk about NPCs. I just talked to Todd Howard, who is the, the creator of Fallout and the Elder Scrolls series. And... Um, Starfield, the new game coming out, and the creator, what I think is the greatest game of all time, which is Skyrim, and the NPCs there, the AI that governs that whole game is very interesting, but the NPCs also are super interesting. And considering what language models might do to NPCs in an open world. That it's just so much harder to make an AI that can talk with you and cooperate with you than it is to make an AI that can fight you. And I think once this technology develops further and you can have a, you can reach a point where like not every single line of dialogue has to be scripted, it unlocks a lot of potential for new kinds of games, like much more like positive interactions that are not so focused on fighting. And I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> it might not be positive. It might be just <laughs> drama. So you would, you, you'll yeah. be in the, like a Call of Duty game and instead of doing the shooting, you'll just be hanging out and like arguing with an AI about like um, like passive aggressive, and then you won't be able to sleep that night. You have to return and ar continue the argument uh -huh. that you were uh, <laughs> emotionally hurt. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think that's actually an exciting world. Whatever, whatever is the drama, the chaos that we love, the push and pull of human connection, I think it's possible to do that in the video game world. Mm -hmm. And it, I think you could be messier and make more mistakes in the video game world, which is why it would be a, a nice place. And and also, it doesn't have a deep of a as deep of a real psychological impact because inside video games, it's kind of understood that you're in a not a real world. So whatever crazy stuff AI does, we have some flexibility to play. Just like with the game of diplomacy, it's a game. This is not real geopolitics. <laughs> starts by playing totally randomly and it learns how to play the game by playing against itself. So um, it will 
start playing the game totally randomly and then it you know if it's playing poker it'll eventually like get to the end of the end of the game and make fifty dollars and then it will like review all of the decisions that it made along the way and say what would have happened if I took this action and the other person takes this action and then I take this action and eventually I make $150 instead of 50. And so it updates the regret value for that action. Regret is basically like, how much does it regret having not played that action in the past? And when it encounters that same situation again, it's going to pick actions that have higher regret with higher probability. Now, It'll just keep simulating the games this way. It'll keep, um, you know, accumulating regrets for different situations. Um, and in the long run, if you pick actions that have high regret with higher probability in the correct way, it's proven to converge to a Nash equilibrium. Even for super complex games, even for imperfect information games. It's true for all games. It's true for it's true for chess. It's true for poker. It's particular. <laughs> Counterfactual regret minimization is a kind of self-play. It's a principled kind of self-play that's proven to converge to Nash equilibria, even in imperfect information games. Now you can have other forms of self-play and people use other forms of self-play for perfect information games um, where you have more flexibility. The algorithm doesn't have to be as theoretically sound um, in order to converge to, to that class of games because there's uh, it's a simpler setting. Sure, so uh, I kind of, in, in my brain, the word self-play has mapped to neural networks, but we're speaking something bigger than just neural networks. It, it could be anything. It, 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 the self-play mechanism is just the mechanism of a system playing itself. Exactly, yeah. Self-play is not tied specifically to neural nets. It's, it's a kind of reinforcement learning, basically. Okay. And I would also say this process of like trying to reason, oh, what would the value have been if I had taken this other action instead? This is very similar to how humans learn to play a game like poker, right? Like you probably played poker before and mm -hmm. with your friends, you probably ask like, oh, would you have called me if I raised there? You right. know, and that's that's a person trying to do the same kind of like learning from a counterfactual that the AI is doing. Okay. And, if and again, then it will choose the action that has, has high regret. Now, the problem is that poker is such a huge game you know, I think in No Limit Texas Hold'em, the version that we were playing has 10 to the 161 different decision points, which is more than the number of atoms in the universe squared. That's heads up? That's heads up, yeah. 10 to the 161, you said? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the number of chips that you have, the stacks and everything, but like the version that we were playing was 10 to the 161. Which I assume would be a somewhat simplified version anyway, because the I bet there's some like step function you had for like bets. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's, I'm saying like, we played the, the full game. And you can say like, well, these other situations, I had high regret for this action. And so maybe I should play that action here as well. Which is the more complex game, chess or poker or go or poker? Do you that know? Is, that is a controversial question. Okay. Um, I'm going to. Oh, it's like somebody screaming on Reddit right now. It depends on which subreddit you're on. Is yeah, it chess or is yeah. it poker? I'm sure like David Silver is going to get really angry at me. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll say, I'm going to say poker actually. And I think for a couple of reasons. Um, They're not here to defend themselves. <laughs> so first of all, you have the imperfect information aspect. And so it's, um, it, we, we can go into that, but like once you introduce imperfect information, uh, things get much more complicated. So we should say, maybe you can describe what is seen to the players, what is not seen uh, in the game of Texas Hold'em. Yeah, so Texas Hold'em, you get two cards face down that only you see. Um, and so that's the hidden information of the game. The other players also all get two cards face down that only they see. Um, and so you have to kind of, as you're playing, reason about like, okay, what do they think I have? What do they have? What do they think I think they have? That kind of stuff. And um that's that's kind of where bluffing comes into play, right? Because the fact that you can bluff, the fact that you can bet with a bad hand and still win is because they don't know what your cards are. Right. And that's the that's the key difference between a perfect information game like poker, uh, sorry, like chess and go, um, and imperfect information games like poker. This is what trash talk looks like. <laughs> the implied statement is 
the game I solved is much tougher. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, when you're playing, I'm just going to do random questions here. So what, when you're playing your opponent under imperfect information, is there some degree to which you're trying to estimate the range of hands that they have? Or is that not part? Mm -hmm. Difficult mm -hmm. is that you have to worry not just about which actions to play, but the probability that you're going to play those actions. So you think about um, rock, paper, scissors, for example. Rock, paper, scissors is an imperfect information game. Um, right. Because you don't know what I'm about to throw. I, I do, but yeah, usually not. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can't just say like, oh, I'm just going to throw a rock every single time mm -hmm. because the other person's going to figure that out and notice a pattern. And then suddenly you're going to start losing. Mm -hmm. And so you don't just have to figure out like which action to play. You have to figure out the probability that you play it. And really importantly, the value of an action depends on the probability that you're going to play it. So if you're playing rock every single time. <laughs> And when you throw a rock, the value of that action is going to be really high. Now you take that to poker. What that means is the value of bluffing, for example, if you're the kind of person that never bluffs and you have this reputation as somebody that, that never bluffs and suddenly you bluff, there's a really good chance that that bluff is. It doesn't matter if you're opening with the queen's gambit 10% of the time or 100% of the time. The value, the expected value, is the same. So, um, so that's that's why we need these algorithms that understand not just we have to figure out what actions are good, but the probabilities. We need to get the exact probabilities correct. And that's actually when we created the bot Libratus. Libratus means balanced because the algorithm that we designed was designed to find that right balance of how often it should play each action. The balance of how often in the key sort of branching is the bluff or not the bluff. Is that, is that a is that a good crude simplification of the major decision in poker? It's a good simplification. I think that's like the main tension, but it's you want to be unpredictable. So you have to think about what would I do if I had this different set of cards? Is there explicit estimation of like a theory of mind that the other person has about you? Or is that just a emergent thing that happens? The way that the bots handle it, the, that are really successful, they have an explicit theory of mind. So they're explicitly reasoning about what are, what's the common knowledge belief? What does what do you think I have? What do I think you have? What do you think I think you have? Um, it's explicitly reasoning about that. Is there multiple use? That An iterative game, you're playing the same person. There is a, there's a stickiness to that, right? You're gathering information as you play. It's not every every um, every hand is a new hand. Is there? Um, a continuation in terms of estimating what kind of player I'm facing here? That's a good question. So you could approach the game that way. The way that the bots do it, they don't, and the way that humans approach it also, expert human players, the way they approach it is to basically assume that you know my strategy. So I'm going to try to pick a strategy where even if I were to play it for 10,000 hands and you could figure out exactly what it was, you still wouldn't be able to beat it. Basically, what that means is I'm trying to approximate the Nash equilibrium. I'm trying to be perfectly balanced because if, if I'm playing the Nash equilibrium, even if you know what my strategy is, like I said, I'm still unbeatable in expectation. So, so that's, what, that's what the bot aims for. And that's actually what a lot of expert poker players aim for as well, to start by playing the Nash equilibrium. And then maybe if they spot weaknesses in the way you're playing, then they can deviate a little bit to take advantage of that. Um, as a way to make you hard to pin down about what your strategy is. So, okay. The thing that I should explain, first of all, with like Nash equilibrium, it doesn't mean that it's predictable. The whole point of it is that you're trying to be unpredictable. Now, I think when somebody like Phil Helmuth might be really right. successful is not in being unpredictable, but in being able to um, take advantage of the other player and figure out where they're being predictable or guiding the other player into thinking 
that you have certain weaknesses and then un- and then understanding how they're going to change their behavior. They're going to deviate from a Nash equilibrium style of play to try to take advantage of those perceived weaknesses and then counter exploit them. So you kind of get into the mind games there. So you think about at least heads up poker as a, as a dance between two agents. I guess are you playing the cards or are you playing the, the player? So this, this gets down to a big argument in the poker community and the academic community. For a long time, there was this debate of like what, what's called GTO, game theory optimal right. poker, or exploitative play. And um, up until about like 2017, when we did the Libratus match, I think actually exploitative play had the advantage. A lot of people were saying like, oh, this whole idea of game theory, it's just nonsense. And if you really want to make money, you got to like look into the other person's eyes and read their soul and figure out what cards they have. But what happened was people started adopting the game theory optimal strategy um, and they were making good money and they weren't trying to adapt so much to the other player. They were just trying to play the Nash equilibrium. And then what really solidified it, I think, was the Libratus, the Libratus match. I think, you know, it, we were playing for $50, $100 blinds. And over the course of about 120,000 hands, it made close to $2 million. 120,000 hands. 120,000 hands. And, uh, against humans. Yeah. And this was this was fake money, to be clear. So there was real money at stake. There was $200,000. First of all, yeah. all money is fake. But um, that's, a, that's, that's a different conversation. Um, we give it meaning. Uh, it's an, it's a, it's, it's a phenomenon that gets meaning from our, uh, complex psychology as a human civilization. Mm. Um, it's emergent from the collective intelligence of the human species, but that's not what you mean. You mean like there's literally, you can't, <laughs> you can't buy stuff with it. Okay. Can you actually uh, step back and take me through that, um, competition? Yeah. Okay. So when I was in grad school, um, there was this thing called the annual computer poker competition mm. where every year. All the different research competition, the 2016 competition. Uh, and so we decided we're going to take this bot, build on it, and play against real top professional heads up, no limit Texas Hold'em poker players. So we invited four of the world's best um, players in this specialty, and we challenged them. them depending on how well they did relative to each other so we wanted to have some incentive for them to play their best did you have a confidence 2014 16 that this is even possible how much doubt was there so and we did a competition actually in 2015 where we also played against professional poker players and the bot lost by by a pretty sizable margin actually now there were some big improvements from 2015 to 2017 and so, can you speak to the improvements? Is it computational in nature? Is it the algorithm, the the methods? It what? was it was really an algorithmic approach. That, that was the mm-hmm. strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, the approach that we took in 2017 was much more search based. It was trying to say, okay, well, let me in real time try to compute uh, a much better strategy than what I had pre computed. Mm-hmm. Is it just a search over actions? So in a game like chess, the the search is like, okay, I'm in this chess position and I can like, you know, move these different pieces and see where things end up. In poker, what you're searching over is the actions that you can take for your hand, the probabilities that you take those actions, and then also the probabilities that you take other actions with other hands that you might have. Um, and, And that's kind of like a hard to wrap your head around. Like, why are you searching over these like other hands that you might have and like trying to figure out what you would do with those hands. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea is, is again, you, you want to, you want to always be balanced and unpredictable. And so if your search algorithm is saying like, Oh, I want to raise with this hand. Well, in order to know whether that's a good action, like, let's say it's a bluff, you know, let's say you have a bad hand and you're saying like, Oh, I, I think I should be betting here with this really bad hand and bluffing. Well, that that's only a good action if you're also betting with a strong hand. Otherwise, it's an obvious bluff. So if your action, in some sense, maximizes your unpredictability, so that action could be mapped by your opponent to a lot of different hands, then that's a good action. Basically, what you want to do is... 
balance between bluffs and good hands, then you're putting them into that tough spot. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're always trying to search for a strategy that would put the opponent into a difficult position. Can you give a metric that you're trying to maximize or minimize? Does this have to do with the regret thing, what we're talking about, in terms of putting your opponent in a maximally tough spot? Yeah, ultimately what you're trying to maximize is your expected winning. So like your expected value, the amount of money that you're going to walk away from, assuming that your opponent was playing optimally in response. So you're going to assume that your opponent is is also playing um, like as, as well as possible a Nash equilibrium approach, because if they're not, then you're just going to make more money, right? Like anything that deviates, like by definition, the Nash equilibrium is the strategy that does the best in expectation. You're always, this is from a, like a self-play reinforcement learning perspective, you're just trying to maximize winnings and the rest is implicit. That's right, yeah. So we're what we're actually trying to maximize is the expected value given that the opponent is playing optimally in response to us. Now in practice, what that ends up looking like is it's putting the opponent into difficult situations where there's no obvious decision to be made. So the the system doesn't know anything about the difficulty of the situation? Not at all. Doesn't care. Okay. Yeah. All right. In my head, it was getting excited whenever. So 2015, we, we, got, we beat pretty badly. And we actually learned a lot from that competition. And in particular... You know, what became clear to me is that the way the humans were approaching the game was very different from how the bot was approaching the game. The bot would not be doing search. It would just be trying to compute, you know, it would do like months of self-play. It would just be playing against itself for months. For sometimes even like five minutes about whether they're going to call or fold a hand. Um, and it became clear to me that that's there's a good chance that that's what miss, that's what's missing from our bot. So I actually did some um, initial experiments to try to figure out how much of a difference does this actually make, and the difference was huge. As a signal to the human player, how long you took to think? No, no, no. I'm not saying that there were any timing tells. I was saying when the human, like the bot, would always act instantly. It wouldn't try to come up with a better strategy in real time um, over what it had pre-computed during training. Whereas the Got human, it. like they have all this intuition about how to play, but they're also in real time leveraging their ability to, to think, to, to search, to plan, um, and coming up with an even better strategy than what, than what their intuition would say. So you're saying that there is, you're doing, that's what you mean by you're doing search also. Yeah. You have an, you have a intuition. a response in like 100 milliseconds or something. It depends on the size of the of the net. But if you can leverage extra computational resources, you can possibly get a much better outcome. And scale up this like pre-computed solution, it was dwarfed by the benefit that we got from search. Can you just linger on what you mean by search here? You're searching over a space of actions for your hand and for other hands how are you selecting the other hands to search over is so yeah randomly no it's all the other hands that you could have so when you're playing no limit texas hold'em you've got two face down cards and so that's 52 choose two 1326 different combinations now that's actually a little bit lower because there's face up cards in the middle and so you can eliminate those as well okay. but you're looking at like around a thousand different possible hands that you can have and so when we're doing, when the bot's doing search, it's thinking explicitly, there are these thousand different hands that I could have. There are these thousand different hands that you could have. Let me try to figure out what would it be a better strategy than what I've pre-computed for these hands and your hands. Okay. So that search, how do you fuse that with what the neural net is telling you or what the, 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 the trained system is telling you? Yeah, so you kind of like, the, where the train system comes in is is the value um, at Got the it. end. So there's, um, you only look so far ahead, you look like maybe, you know, one round ahead. So if you're on the... Is it of a single action, essentially, in that spot? 
you're, you're getting a value or is it the value of the entire series of actions? Well, it's kind of both um, because you're, you're trying to maximize the value for the hand that you have, but in the process, in order to maximize the value of the hand that you have, you have to figure out what would I be doing with all these other hands as well. Um, okay, but you, are you in the search always going to the end of the game? In Libratus, we did. Uh, so we only used search starting on the turn. And then we searched all the way to the end of the game. The turn, the river. Uh, can, can we take yeah. it th yeah, yeah, through the terminology? Yeah, there's, there's four rounds of poker. So there's the preflop, the flop, the turn, and the river. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we would start doing search halfway through the game. Now, the first half of the game, that was all pre-computed. It would just act instantly. And then when it got to the halfway point, then it would always search to the end of the game. Now, we later improved this so it wouldn't have to search all the way to the end of the game. It would actually search um, just a few moves ahead. Um, but that that came later, and that drastically reduced the num the amount of computational resources that we needed. But the moves, because you can keep betting on top of it. What are you going to do in response? Are you going to raise me? Or are you going to call? And then if you raise, what should I do? So it's reasoning about that whole process up until the end of the game in the case of Libratus. So for Libratus, what's the, the most number of re-raises have you ever seen? <laughs> uh, you probably cap out at like five or something because at that point you're basically all in, you know? I mean, is there like uh, interesting patterns like that that you've seen that the game does? Like you, you have... <laughs> Like, oh, if you want, you can bet like 10 times the pot. Mm -hmm. And we didn't think it would actually do that. It was just like, why not give it the option? And then during the competition, it actually started doing this. And by the way, this is like a very last minute decision on our part to add this option. And so we did not we, we did not think the bot would would do this. And uh, I was actually kind of worried when it did start to do this. Like, oh, is this, a, is this a problem? Like humans don't do this. The bot bets twenty thousand dollars into a you know a thousand dollar pot and and it's basically saying like I have the best hand or I'm bluffing and you having the second best hand like now you get a really tough choice to make and so the humans would sometimes think like five or ten minutes about like what do you do should should I call should I fold and um, and when I saw the humans like really struggling with that decision like that's when I realized like oh actually this is maybe a good thing to do after all and of course, the system doesn't know that it's making, again, like we said, that it's putting them in a tough spot. It's 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 just that's part of the optimal, the, the game theory optimal. Right from the bot's perspective, it's just it's just doing the thing that's going to make it the most money. Um, and the fact that it's putting the humans in a difficult spot, like that's just um, you know a side effect of that. And this was, I think, the. The one thing, I mean, there were a few things that the humans walked away from, but this was the the number one thing that the humans walked away from the competition saying, like, we need to start doing this. Hmm. Um, and now these overbets, what are called overbets, have become really common in high-level poker play. Have you ever talked to like somebody like Daniel on the ground about this? He seems to be a student of the game. I did actually have a conversation with Daniel DeGranio once, yeah. I was uh, I was visiting the Isle of Man to talk to poker stars about AI. Um, and Daniel Legrandi was there when we had dinner together with uh, some other people. And um, yeah, he's, he was really interested in it. He mentioned that he was like, you know, excited about like learning from these AIs. Um, so he wasn't scared, he was excited. He was excited and uh, and he all, he honestly, he wanted to play against the bot. He thought he, he, thought he had a decent chance of, of beating it. Um, I, yeah. I think he, you know, this was like a, a, several years ago when I think it was like not as clear to everybody that, you know, the AIs were taking over. Yeah. I think now people recognize that like if you're playing again. No Limit Texas Hold'em is the bots win? Yeah, that's the case. So I think there is some debate about like, is it true for every single variant of poker? I think, I think for every single variant of poker, if somebody really put in the effort, they can make an AI that would beat all humans at it. Um, we've focused on the most popular variants. So heads up, no limit, Texas Hold'em. And then we followed it up with um, with uh, six player poker as well, where we managed to uh, make a bot that beat expert human players. And I think even there now, 
uh, it's pretty clear that humans don't stand a chance. See, I would love to hook up. The common poker wisdom when they're telling, where they're teaching players before there were bots, and they were trying to teach people how to play poker. They would say like, the key to the game is to put your opponent into difficult spots. It's a good um, a good estimate for if you're making the right decision. So, what else can you say about the fundamental role of search in poker? And maybe if you can also relate it to chess and go in these games, um, what's the role of search to solve in these games? Yeah, I think a lot of people under, this is true for the general public. And I think it's true for the AI community. A lot of people underestimate the importance of search for these kinds of game AI results. Um, an example of this is uh, TD Gammon that came out in 1992. This was the the first real instance of a neural net being used in a game AI. It's a landmark achievement. It was actually the inspiration for AlphaZero. And it used search. It used two-ply search to figure out its next move. You got Deep Blue. There, it was very heavily focused on search, um, looking many, many moves ahead, farther than any human could. And that was key for why it won. And then even with something like AlphaGo, I mean, AlphaGo is commonly hailed as a, a landmark achievement for neural nets, and it is, but there's also this huge component of search, Monte Carlo tree search to AlphaGo, that was key, absolutely essential for the AI to be able to beat top humans. Um, I think a good example of this is humans, and you can compare bots to humans. Now, a top human player is around 3,600 ELO, maybe a little bit higher now. Um, Alpha Zero, the strongest version, is around 5,200 ELO. But if you take out the search that's being done at test time, and by the way, what I mean by search is the planning ahead, the, the thinking of like, oh, if I move my, if I place this stone here and then he does this, and then you look like five moves ahead and you see like what the board state looks like, um, that's what I mean by search. If you take out this, it's worth lingering on. That's that's quite profound. So uh, without search, that just means looking at the next move and saying this is the best move. So having a function that estimates accurately what the best move is. That's right. Without search. It, it's kind of like a, the intuition that a human has. You know, the, the human looks at the board and and any uh, Go or chess master will be able to tell you like, oh, instantly, here's what I think the right move is. Um, and the bot is able to do the same thing. But just like how a human grandmaster can make a better decision if they have more time to think, when you add on this Monte Carlo tree search, the bot is able to make a better decision. Yeah, I mean, of course, a human is doing something like search in their brain, but it's not. So it's like a different, it's a, the neural network is doing the searching. I don't, I wonder what the human brain is doing in terms of searching, because you're doing that like computation, mm -hmm. a human is computing. Leading all the details, but they're still doing search in their head. But it's a different kind of search. Have you ever thought about like what is the difference between the human, the search that the human is performing versus what computers are doing? I have thought a lot about that, and I think it's a really important question. So the AI in Alpha and Alphas in AlphaGo or any of these. Into a game like poker, for example, it doesn't work. It it can't. It can't understand the concept of hidden information. It doesn't understand the balance that you have to strike between like the amount that you're raising versus the amount that you're calling. Mm -hmm. And in every one of these games, you see a different kind of search. And the human brain is able to plan for all these different games in a very general way. Um, now, I think that's one thing that we're, we're missing from AI today. And I think it's a really important missing piece. The ability to plan and reason more generally um, across a wide variety uh, of different settings. In a way where the general reasoning makes you better at each one of the games, yeah. not worse. Yeah, so you can kind of think of it as like neural nets today, they'll give you, an, like Transformers, for example, are super general. 
but you know they'll give you it'll it'll output an answer in like a hundred milliseconds. And if you tell it like, oh, you've got five minutes to give you a decision, you know, feel free to take more time to make a better decision. It's not going to know what to do with that. Um, but a human, if you're playing a game like chess, they're going to give you a very different answer depending on if you say, oh, you've got a hundred milliseconds or you've got five minutes. Yeah, there. I mean, there people have started using right, transformers with language models like the in an iterative way that does improve the answer or like showing the work They've kind of this, kind yeah. of idea. Yeah, they got in, in a game like chess, so there's a kind of search that you can do where you're saying, like, I'm going to roll out my intuition and see, like, without really thinking, you know, what are the better decisions I can make farther down the path? Um, what would I do if I just acted according to intuition for the next 10 moves? Um, and that gets you an improvement. But I think that there's much, uh, much richer kinds of, of planning that we could do. So when Labrados actually beat the poker players, what what did that feel like? What was that? I mean, actually on that day, what were you feeling like? Were you were you nervous? I mean, poker was one of the games that you thought like is not going to be solvable because the human factor. So, uh, at least in the narratives we tell ourselves, the human factor is so fundamental to the game of poker. Yeah, the Labrados competition was super stressful for me. Um, also, I mean, I was working on this like basically continuously for a year leading up to the competition. I mean, for me, it became like very clear, like, okay, this is the search technique. This is the approach that we need. And then I spent a year working on this pretty much like nonstop. Oh, can we actually get into details? Like what programming language is, is it written in? What's some interesting uh, implementation details that are like fun slash painful? Yeah. So one of the interesting things about Labrades. Uh, but we had no idea like what the bar actually was. And so we threw a huge amount of resources at trying to make the strongest bot possible. Mm -hmm. So we used C++. It was parallelized. We were using, I think, like a thousand CPUs, um, maybe, maybe more actually. Um, and, you know, today that sounds like nothing, but for a grad student back in 2016, that was a, a huge amount of resources. Well, it's still a lot for even any grad student today. Yeah. It's still tough to to get, or even to to allow yourself to think in that uh, in terms of scale at CMU at MIT, anything like that. Yeah, and you know, talking about terabytes of memory, um, so it was a very parallelized, um, and it had to be very fast too, because the more games that you could simulate. Uh, the stronger the bot would be. So is there some like John Carmack style, like efficiencies you had to come up with, like a, an efficient way to represent the hand, all that kind of stuff? There were all, all sorts of optimizations that I had to make to try to get this thing to run as fast as possible. All, all these kinds of different decisions that that I, you know, had to make. Uh, just a fun question. What, what ID did you use? What uh, for for C plus uh, plus? I think I think I used uh, Visual Studio actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that still carried through? To Super stressful. Um, I mean, I thought going into it that we had like a fifty fifty chance because basically I thought if if they play in a totally normal style, I think we'll squeak out a win. But there's always a chance that they can find some weakness in the bot. Mm -hmm. And if they do, and we're we're playing like for twenty days, one hundred twenty thousand hands of poker. They have, a and then also, um, when it the bot got into really difficult all in situations, it, it wasn't able to because it wasn't doing search. It had to clump different hands together, and it wouldn't. It would treat them identically. Yeah. Um. And so it wouldn't be able to distinguish. You know, like having a king high flush versus an ace high flush. And in some situations that really matters a lot. And so they could put the bot into those situations and then the bot would would just bleed money. Clever humans. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't realize it was over 20 days. So um, what were the humans like over those 20 days? And what was the bot like? So we had set up the competition, you know, like I said, there was $200,000 in prize money and they would get paid 
a fraction of that, depending on how well they did relative to each other. Yeah. So I was kind of hoping that they wouldn't work together to try to find weaknesses in the bot, but they entered the competition with their like number one objective being to beat the bot. And they didn't care about like individual glory. They were like, we're all going to work as a team to try to take down this bot. Yeah. And um, so they immediately started comparing notes. What they would do is they would coordinate looking at different parts of the strategy to try to try to you know find out weaknesses um and then at the end of the day we actually sent them a log of all the hands that were played and what cards the bot had on each of those hands oh wow yeah that's yeah. that's gutsy yeah it was honestly I and mean, i'm not sure why we did that in retrospect but um i mean i'm glad we did it because we ended up winning anyway but that if if you've ever played poker before like that is golden information <laughs> Then, then they would coordinate and study together and try to figure out, okay, now this person's going to explore this part of the strategy for weaknesses. This person's going to explore this part of the strategy for weaknesses. <laughs> it's a kind of psychological warfare showing them the hands. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure you didn't think of it that way, but like doing that means you're confident in the, the bot's ability to win. Well, that's, that's one way of putting it. I wasn't uh, super confident. Yeah. So, you know, going in, like I said, I think I had like, 50 50 odds on us winning the when we actually when we announced the competition the poker community decided to gamble on who would win mm -hmm. and their initial odds against us were like four to one they, they were really convinced that the humans were gonna pull out a win mm -hmm. um the bot ended up winning for three days straight and even then after three days the betting odds were still just 50 50 um <laughs> I think what happened is like they thought that they spotted some weaknesses that weren't actually there. Mm -hmm. And then around day eight, it was just very clear that they were getting absolutely crushed. Um, and and from that point, for, I mean, for, for a while there, I was super stressed out thinking like, oh my God, the humans are coming back and we're just, they've found weaknesses and now we're just going to lose the whole thing. But no, it, it ended up going in the other direction and the bot ended up like crushing them in the long run. How did it uh, feel at the end? Like as a human being, what it, as a person who loves, appreciates the beauty of the game of poker, and as a person who appreciates the beauty of AI, is there? Did you feel a certain kind of way about it? Uh, I felt a lot of a lot of things, man. Um, I mean, at that point in my life, I had spent five years working on this project, and um, it was. A huge sense of accomplishment. I mean, to spend five years working on something and finally see it succeed. Um, yeah, I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. Yeah, because it's uh, that's a real to beat the machine. So this is a real benchmark, unlike anything else. Yeah, and I mean, this is this is what I had been dreaming about since I was like sixteen, playing poker, you know, with my friends in high school. The idea that you could find a strategy. Um, uh, uh, you know, approximate the Nash equilibrium, be able to beat all the poker players in the world with it, you know? So to actually see that come to fruition and, and be realized, uh, that was, it's kind of magical. Yeah, especially money is on the line too. It's a different, it's different than chess. And th that aspect, like people get, that's why you want to look at betting markets. If you want to actually understand what people really think. And in the same sense, poker, it's really high stakes because it's money. And to solve that game, that's that's an amazing accomplishment. So uh, the leap from that to multi-way, six-player poker, what's how difficult is that jump? And what are some interesting differences between heads-up poker? And when it does. Now, once you go to six-player poker, you're no longer playing a two-player zero-sum game. And so there was a lot of debate among the academic community and among the poker community about how well these techniques would extend beyond just two-player heads-up poker. Now, what I had come to realize is that um, the techniques actually I thought... Now... There were a lot of complications that would come up with six player poker besides like the game theoretic aspect. I mean, for one, the game is just exponentially larger. Um, so the main thing that allowed us to go from two player to six player was the idea of depth limited search. 
So I said before, like, you know, we would do search, we would plan out, the bot would plan out like what, what it's going to do next and for the next several moves. And in Labratus, that search was done extending all the way to the end of the game. So it would have to start um, it, it, from, from the turn onwards, like looking maybe 10 moves ahead. Um, it would have to figure out. Right now. Is there something cool in the paper in terms of graphics? A game tree traverse of via Monte Carlo. I think if you go down a bit. Uh... Uh, figure one, an example of equilibrium selection problem. Ooh, so yeah. Uh, what do we know about equilibria when it's, there's multiple players? So when you go outside of two players, zero sum. So a Nash equilibrium is a set of strategies, like one strategy for each player where no player has an incentive to switch to a different strategy. There's a, a Nash equilibrium is for all the players to be spaced equally apart around this ring. But there's infinitely many different Nash equilibria, right? There's infinitely many ways to space four dots along a ring. And if every single player independently computes a Nash equilibrium, then there's no guarantee that the joint strategy that they're all playing um, is going to result is going to be an Nash equilibrium. They're they're just going to be like random dots scattered along this ring rather than four coordinated dots being equally spaced apart. Is it possible to sort of optimally do this kind of selection to do the, the selection of uh, of the equilibrium you're chasing? So is there like a meta problem to be solved here? So the meta problem is in some sense um, how do you how do you understand the Nash equilibria that the other players are going to play? Um, and, and even if you do that, again, there's no guarantee that you're going to win. So, yeah. you know, if you're playing, uh, if you're playing risk, like I said, and, and all the other players decide to team up against you, you're going to lose. Nash equilibrium doesn't help you there. And so there was this big debate about whether Nash equilibrium and all these techniques that compute it are even useful once you go outside a two-player zero-sum game. This issue that the approach of a, trying to approximate a Nash equilibrium doesn't really work anymore. But it turns out that in six-player poker, um, because six-player poker is such an adversarial game um, where none of the players really try to work with each other, the techniques that were used in two-player poker to try to approximate an equilibrium, those still end up working in practice in, in six-player poker as well. There's some deep way in which six-player poker is just a bunch of heads-up poker like games in one. It's like uh it's like embedded in it. So the competitiveness um is more fundamental to poker than the cooperation. Right, yeah. Poker is just such an adversarial game. There's no real cooperation. In fact, you're not even allowed to cooperate in poker. It's considered collusion. It's against the rules. Um, there are classes of games where uh, this approach to approximating an Ash equilibrium is proven to work well. Now, six-player poker is not known to belong to one of those classes, but it is possible that there is some class of games where it either provably performs well or provably performs not that badly. So what are some interesting things about uh, Pluribus? That, that it was so much cheaper than Libratus. I mean, Libratus, if you had to put a price tag on, on the computational resources that went into it, I would say the final training run took about $100,000. You go to Pluribus, the final training run would cost like less than $150 on AWS. Is this normalized to uh, computational inflation? So meaning, uh, this is, is this just, does this just have to do with the fact that Pluribus was trained like a year later? No, 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 it's not, it's, I mean, first of all, like, yeah, computing resources are, are getting cheaper every day and like, but you're not gonna see a, a thousand fold decrease in the computational resources over two years. Um, or even anywhere close to that. The the real improvement was algorithmic improvements, and in particular, the ability to do depth-limited search. So it, does depth-limited search also work for Libratus? Yeah, yes. So where this depth-limited search came from is, you know, I, I developed this technique and 
um, ran it on two-player poker first. And that reduced the computational resources needed to make an AI that was superhuman from you know $100,000 for Libratus to something you could train on your laptop. What do you learn from that? Um, from that discovery? What I would take away from that is that algorithmic improvements really do matter. How would you describe the more general case of limited dev search? So it's basically constraining the scale, temporal, or in some other way of the computation you're doing in some clever way. So like with, like how else can you significantly constrain computation, right? Well, I think the idea is that we want to be able to leverage search as much as possible. And the way that we were doing it in Libratus required us to search all the way to the end of the game. Now, if you're playing a game like chess, the idea that you're going to search always to the end of the game is kind of unimaginable, right? Like there's just so many situations where you just won't be. Did you use neural nets for uh, Libratus and Pluribus? And more generally, what role do neural nets have to play in, um, in superhuman level performance in poker? So we actually did not use neural nets at all for Libratus or Pluribus. And a lot of people found this surprising back in 2017. I think they found it surprising today um, that we were able to do this without using any neural nets. Um, and I think the reason for that, I mean, I think neural nets are um, incredibly powerful and the techniques that are used today, even for poker AIs, do rely uh, quite heavily on neural nets. Um, but it wasn't the main challenge for poker. Like, I think what neural nets are really good for, if you're in a situation where finding features for a value function is really difficult, then neural nets are really powerful. And this was the problem in Go, right? Like the problem in Go was that, or the final problem in Go at least, was that nobody had a good way of looking at a board and figuring out who was winning or and, and describing um, through a simple algorithm who was winning or losing. And so there, neural nets were super helpful because you could just feed in a ton of different board positions into this neural net, and it would be able to predict then who was winning or losing. But in poker, the features weren't the challenge. Um, that would understand that you have to bluff with the right probability. So can that be somehow incorporated into the, the value function? this, the complexity of poker that you've described? Yeah, so the way the value functions work in poker, like the latest and greatest poker AIs, they do use neural nets for the value function. The way it's done is, is very different from how it's done in a game like chess or go, because in poker, you have to reason about beliefs. And so the value of a state depends on the beliefs that players have about what the different cards are. Like if you have pocket aces, then whether that's a really, really good hand or just an okay hand depends on whether you know I have pocket aces, right? Like if you know that I have pocket aces, then if I bet you're going to fold immediately. But if you think that I have a really bad hand, then I could bet with pocket aces and make a ton of money. So the value function in poker these days takes the beliefs as an input which is very different from like how, how chess and Go AIs work. So as a person who appreciates the game, uh, who do you think is the greatest poker player of all time? That's a, that's a tough question. You could play, you could be profitable in poker for a year and it, you could actually be a bad player just because the variance is so high. I mean, you've got, top professional poker players that would lose. In poker, that's a very noisy signal. It's a very noisy signal. Now there is a signal there. And so you, you yeah. could do this, this calculation. It would just be much harder. Um, but the same way that AIs have now taken over chess and, you know, all the top professional chess players train with, with AIs, the same is true for poker. Um, the game has become... Uh, a very computational um, people train with AIs to try to find out where they're making mistakes, um, try to learn from the AIs to improve their strategy. Uh, so now 
yeah, so the, the game has been revolutionized this, this, in the past five years by by the development of AI in this sport. The skill with which you avoided the question of the greatest of all time was impressive. So my feeling is that it's a difficult it's a difficult question because just like in chess, where you can't really compare Magnus Carlsen today to Gary Kasparov, um, because the game has evolved so much. Um, the poker players today are so far beyond the. The, the skills of like people that were playing even 10 or 20 years ago. Um, so you look at the, the kinds of like all-stars that were on ESPN at like the height of the poker boom, pretty much all those players are actually not that good at the game today. At, at least, the, at least the, the strategy aspect. I mean, there might be still be good at like reading the player at the other side of the table and trying to figure out like, are they bluffing or not? But in terms of the actual like computational strategy of the game, um, a lot of them have really struggled to keep up with that development. Now, so for that reason, I'll I'll give an answer, and I'm going to say Daniel Legrano, who you actually had on the podcast recently. I saw it was a great episode. I love this yeah. so much, <laughs> and <laughs> and Phil's going to hate this so much. <laughs> and, and I'm I'm going to give him I'm going to give him credit because. He- given up on that aspect and and I got to give Dan Negreanu credit for for keeping up with all the developments that are happening in the sport. Yeah, it's fascinating to watch. It's fascinating to watch where it's headed. Um yeah, so there you go. Some love for Daniel. Quick pause. Bathroom break? Yeah, let's do it. Let's go from poker to diplomacy. What is a, at a high level the game of diplomacy? Yeah, so I talked a lot about two-player zero-sum games. And what's interesting about diplomacy is that it's very different from these like adversarial uh, games like chess, Go, poker, even StarCraft and Dota. Diplomacy has a much bigger cooperative element to it. It's a seven-player game. It was actually created in the 50s, um, and it takes place uh, before World War I. It's like a map of Europe with seven great powers. Um, and they're all trying to form alliances with each other. There's a lot of negotiation going on. Um, and so the whole focus of the game is on forming alliances, talking to the other players in private, and you make all sorts of deals with them. You say like, hey, let's work together. Um, you know, let's team up against this other player because the only way that you can make progress is by working with somebody else against the others. Um, And then after that negotiation period is done, all the players simultaneously submit their moves and they're all executed at the same time. And so you can tell people like, hey, I'm going to support you this turn. Different ways to play the game. You know, you can play it in person, and in that case, it's all natural language, um, free form communication. There's no constraints on the kinds of deals that you can make, the kinds of things that you can discuss. Um, you can also play it online, so you can, you know, send long emails back and forth. Um, you can play it like live on. Want? Um, you can make any sorts of deals that you want, and everything is done privately. So it's not like you're all around the board together having a conversation. You're grabbing somebody going off into a corner and conspiring behind everybody else's back about what you're planning. And uh, there's no limit in theory to the conversation you can have directly with one person. That's right. You can make all sorts of, um, you can talk about anything. You could say like, hey, let's have a long-term alliance against this guy. You can say like, hey, can you support me this turn? And in return, I'll do this other thing for you next turn. Or, um, you know, yeah, just you can talk about like what you talked about with somebody else and gossip. Poker and the TV show Survivor. There's like this big element of like trying to, um, yeah, there's a, there's a big social element. And, and the best way that I would describe the game is that it's really a game about people rather than the pieces. So risk because it is a map it's kind of war game like uh poker because there's a game theory component that's very kind of strategic so you could convert it into an artificial intelligence problem and then survive it because of the social component that's a strong social component i saw that somebody said online that 
the internet version of the, of the game has this quality of uh, like really imagine yourself as the leader of France or Russia and so on. Like really pretend to be that person. It's actually fun to really lean into being that that leader. Yeah, so some some players do go this route where they just like kind of view it as a strategy game, but also a role playing game where they can like act out like, what would I be like if I was you know a leader of France in 1900? Oh, forfeit right away. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um. <laughs> On every turn, you got like a bunch of different units that you start out with. So you start out um, controlling like. Just a few units, and the object of the game is to gain control of a majority of the map. If you're able, to, if you're able to do that, then you've won the game. But like I said, the only way that you're able to do that is by working with other players. So on every turn, you can issue a move order. So for each of your units, you can move them to an adjacent territory, or you can keep them where they are, or you can support a move or a hold of a different unit. So. What are the territories? What, how how is the map divided up? It's kind of like Risk, where the the map is divided up into like fifty different territories. Yeah. Um, now you can enter a territory if you're moving into that territory with more supports than the person that's in there or the person that's trying to move in there. So if you're moving in and there's somebody already there, um, then if neither of you have support, it's a one versus one, and you'll bounce back, and neither of you will make progress. If you have a unit that's supporting that move into the territory, then it's a two versus one and you'll kick them out and they'll have to retreat somewhere. What does support mean? Support is like, it's a... It's a but you can also support other people's units into territories. And so that's what the negotiations really revolve around. But you don't have to do... Extension is absolutely core to the game. The... The fact that you can make all sorts of promises, but you have to reason about the fact that like, hey, they might not trust you if you say you're going to do something, or they might be... Things that the cool kids say they, they do, but they don't actually play. So the game was created in the 50s. Yeah. Um, and from what I understand, it, it was um, JFK's... It was played in like the JFK White House, Henry Kissinger's favorite game. I don't know if it's... Um, somebody that had looked at the history of, of the 20th century and they saw World War I as a failure of diplomacy. So, sure, yeah. you know, they saw the fact that this war broke out uh, as like the, the diplomats of all these countries like really failed to prevent a war. And he wanted to create a game that would basically teach people about diplomacy. Um, and... It's really fascinating that like in his ideal version of the game of diplomacy, nobody actually wins the game because the whole point is that if somebody is about to win, then the other players should be able to work together to stop that person from winning. And so the ideal version of the game is just one where, where nobody actually wins. And, you know, it kind of has a nice, like wholesome take home message then that, you know, war, war is ultimately futile and, uh, and, uh, that optimal, that feudal optimal could be achieved through great diplomacy. Yes. So uh, is there some asymmetry in, in terms of which is more powerful, Russia versus Germany versus uh, France and so on? So I think the general consensus is that France is the strongest power in the game. But okay. the beautiful thing about diplomacy is that it's, it's self-balancing, right? So it's the fact that France has an inherent advantage from the beginning means that the other players are less likely to work with it. I saw that Russia has four units for, or four of something that the others have three of something. That's true, yeah. So Russia starts off with four units while they, all the other players start with three. But Russia is also in a much more vulnerable position because they have to like, um, they have a lot more neighbors as well. Got it. Yeah. Larger territory, more, uh, yeah, right. More border mm -hmm. to defend. Okay. Uh 15 or 20 turns. Um, there's in theory, no limit. It could last longer, but at some point, I mean, if you're playing a house game with friends, at some point you just get tired and you all agree like, okay, we're going to end the game here and call it a draw. Um, if you're playing online, there's usually like set limits on when the game will actually end. And what's... 
you know, all the players agree to a draw and then the the score, the the win is divided among the the remaining players. Um, there's a lot of different scoring systems. The one that we used in our research um, basically um, gives a score relative to how much control you have of the map. So the more that you control, the higher your score. What's the history of using this game as a benchmark for AI research? Do, pe do people use it? Yeah, so people have been working... The research in the 80s was a very uh, rule-based approach, kind of it, kind of a heuristic approach. It was very in line with the kind of research that was being done in the 80s. You know, basically trying to... So, so much more complicated than the kinds of games that people were working on, like chess and Go uh, and poker, that it was honestly even hard to like start getting making any progress in, in in diplomacy can you just formulate what is the problem from an ai perspective and why is it hard why is it a challenging game to solve so there's a lot of aspects in diplomacy that make it a huge challenge um first of all you have the natural language component, and i think this really is what makes it arguably the most difficult um uh, game among like the major benchmarks the fact that you have to, it's not about moving pieces on the board. Your action space is basically all the different sentences that you could communicate to somebody else in this game. Yeah. And um, is there, can we just like linger on that? So is part of it like the ambiguity in the language? If if it was like very strict, if you narrowed the set of possible sentences you could do, would that simplify the game significantly? The, the real difficulty is the breadth of things that you can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, you could have natural language in other games, uh, like Settlers of Catan, for example. Like you could have a natural language Settlers of Catan AI. But the things that you're going to talk about are basically like, am I trading you two sheep for a wood or three sheep for a wood? Um, whereas in a game like Diplomacy, the breadth of conversations that you're going to have are like, you know, am I going to support you? Are you going to support me in return? Which units are, are going to do what? Uh, what did this other person sit, promise you? Uh, they're lying because they told this other person that they're going to do this instead. Um, if you help me out this turn, then in the future, I'll... We thought the most impactful way of doing this research would be to uh, address the natural language component head on and just try to go for the full game up front. Just looking at sample games and what the conversations look like. Greetings, England. This should prove to be a fun game since all the private press is going to be made public at the end. At the least, it will be interesting to see if the press changes because of that. Anyway, good. Okay. So there, there's like... Uh... Yeah, that's just kind of like the generic greetings at the beginning of the game. Okay. I think that the meat comes a little bit later when you're starting to talk about like specific strategy and stuff i agree there are a lot of advantages to the two of us keeping in touch and our nations make strong natural allies in the middle game so that kind of stuff uh making friends making enemies yeah or like if you look at the next line so the person saying like i've heard uh bits about a lepanto and an octopus opening and basically telling austria like hey just a heads up you know i've heard these whispers about like what might be going on behind your back yeah so, but so there's all kinds of complexities in that, in the in the language of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like to interpret what that what the heck that means. It's hard for us humans, but for AI, it's even harder because you have to understand like at every level the the semantics of that. Right. I mean, there's the there's the complexity in under. This is actually. Um, something that I find really interesting. If you look at all of the previous game AI uh, breakthroughs, they've all happened in these purely adversarial games where you don't actually need to understand how humans play the game. It's all just AI versus AI, right? Like you look at uh, checkers, chess, Go, poker, StarCraft, Dota 2. Like in some of those cases, they leveraged human data, but they never needed to. They were always just trying to have a scalable algorithm that of a Nash equilibrium, this perfect strategy 
that in a two-player zero-sum game guarantees that they're going to be able to not lose to any opponent. So you can't leverage self-play to solve this game. You you can leverage self-play, but it's no longer sufficient to beat humans. So how do you integrate the human into the loop of this? So what you have to do is incorporate human data. Um, and to kind of give you some intuition for why this is the case, like imagine you're playing a negotiation game like, like diplomacy, um, but you're training completely from scratch without any human data. The, the AI is not going to suddenly like figure out how to communicate in English. It's going to figure out some weird robot language that only it will understand. Yeah. And then when you stick that in a game with six other humans, they're going to think this person's talking gibberish and they're just going to ally with each other and team up against the bot. Or not even team up against the bot, but just not work with them. That, that's, a, that's a nuanced thing to understand because the a chess playing program doesn't need to play like a human to beat a human. Exactly. But here you have to play like a human in order to beat them. Or at least you have to understand how humans play the game so that you can understand how to work with them. If they have certain expectations about what does it mean to be a good ally, what does it mean to have like a, a reciprocal relationship where we're working together, you have to abide by those conventions. And if you don't, they're just going to work with somebody else instead. Do you think of this as a, a clean in some deep... <laughs> natural language conversation seems like very difficult to evaluate like here at a high stakes where humans are trying to win a game that seems like how you actually perform the Turing test i think it's different from the Turing test like the way that the Turing test is formulated it's about trying to distinguish a human from a machine and seeing oh could the machine uh successfully pass as a human in this adversarial setting where the a where the player is trying to figure out whether it's a machine or a human. Whereas in diplomacy, it's not about trying to figure out whether this player is a human or a machine. It's ultimately... Requirement for that is for the machine to be human-like. I, I think that's true, that if you're going to play in this human game, you have to somehow adapt to the, to the human surroundings and the human play style. And to win, you have to adapt. So you can't, if you're the outsider, if you're not human-like, I feel like that's a losing strategy. I think that's, I think that's correct, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, what, what are the complexities here? What was your approach to it? Before I get to that, one thing I should explain, like why we decided to work on diplomacy. Yeah. So basically what happened is in 2019, um, I was wrapping up the work on six player poker on Pluribus and was trying to think about what to work on next. And I had been seeing like all these other breakthroughs happening in AI. I mean, like 2019, you have Starcraft, you have Alpha Star beating. Mm -hmm. And it became clear that AI was progressing really, really rapidly. And People were throwing out these like other games about, you know, what should be the next challenge for, for multi-agent AI. And I just felt like we had to aim bigger. Um, if you look at a game like chess or a game like Go, they took decades for researchers to right choice considering just how much progress there there was in AI and that, that progress has continued in the years since. So winning in diplomacy, what does that really look like? It means talking to six other players, six other entities, agents, and convincing and convincing them of stuff that you want them to be convinced of. Like what what exactly I'm trying to get like to deeply understand what the problem is. Ultimately, the problem is, is simple to, to quantify, right? Like you're going to play this game with humans and you want your score on average to be um, as high as possible. You know, if you can say like, I am winning more than any, any human alive, um, then you're a champion diplomacy player. Um, 
Now, ultimately, we have we didn't reach that. We got to human level performance. We actually so we played about forty games with with real humans online. Uh, the bot came in second out of all players that played five or more games, and um, so not like number one, but way way higher than. Well, the what was the expertise level? Are they beginners? Are they intermediate players? Advanced players? So Give that, a sense. That's a great question, and so I think this kind of goes into how do you measure the performance in diplomacy? And I would argue that when you're measuring performance in a game like this, you don't actually want to measure it in games with all expert players. I played a lot of sports in my life, like I did tennis, judo, whatever. And it's somehow almost easier to go against experts almost always. I don't, I don't, I think they're more predictable in the quality of play. <laughs> the yeah. the space of strategies you're operating under is narrower against experts. It's more fun. It's really frustrating to go against beginners. Also, because beginners talk trash to you when they somehow do beat you. So it's, that's a human thing that they add doesn't to be worried about that. But yeah, the variance in strategies right. is is greater, especially with natural language. It's just all over the place. Then, True. yeah, and and honestly, when you look at what makes a good human diplomacy player? Um, obviously, they're able. To... They're a weak player that they won't be able to like pull off a stab as well, or that um, they have certain tendencies and they can take them under their wing and persuade them to do things that might not even be in their interest. Um, the really good diplomacy players are are able to to take advantage of the fact that they're in, that they're. leverage the benefits of self-play that have been so successful in all these other previous games while keeping the strategy as uh, as human compatible as possible. And so what we did is we first trained a, a language model, um, and then we made that language model controllable on a set of, in, uh, on a set of intents, uh, what, we, what we call intents, which are basically like an action that we want to play and an action that we would like. <laughs> Uh, a, an intent, a purpose in its communication. We can talk about a specific move or we can make a specific request. And the determination of what that move is that we're discussing comes from um, strategic re a strategic reasoning model that uses reinforcement learning and planning. So the computing the intents for all the players, how is that done? Just so as a starting point. Is that with reinforcement learning or is that just We're using self-play and and search to try to figure out what are what is an optimal move for us and what is a desirable move that we would like this other player to play. Now, the the difference between the way that we approached reinforcement learning and search in this game versus those previous games is that we have to keep it human compatible. We have to understand how the other person is likely to play rather than just assuming that they're gonna play like a machine. And how language gets them to play um, in a way that maximizes the chance of following the intent you want mm -hmm. them to follow. Okay, how do, how do you do that? How do you, you, how do you connect language to intent? So the way that RL and, and planning is done is actually not using language. So we're we're, coming up with this like plan for the action uh, that we're going to play and the other person's going to play. And then we feed that action into the dialogue model that will then send a message according to those plans. So the language. Uh, basically one message at a time. So we'll, we'll feed into the dialogue model. Like here are the actions that you should be discussing. Here's the message. Here's like the, the content of the message that we would like you to send. And then it will actually generate a message that corresponds to that. Okay. Does this actually work? It works surprisingly well. Okay. How? <laughs> oh, man. We don't tell the, the language model, like, here are the pieces of our action or the other person's action that you should be communicating. Mm -hmm. And so, like, let's say you're about to t attack somebody. You probably don't want to tell them that you're going to attack them, mm -hmm. but there's nothing in the language, like the language model is not very smart at the end of the day. So it, it doesn't really have a way of knowing like, well, what should I be talking about? They, 
message is a negative expected value action and we should not send this message. So yes, for, for particular kinds of messages, you have like an extra function that does the, uh, the estimates the value of that message. Yeah. So we have these kinds of filters right. that like... So it's a filter. So there's a, there's a good... Uh, and is that filter a neural network or is it rule based? That's that's a that's a neural network. So we're well, it's a it's a combination. It's a neural network, but it's also using planning. Um, it's trying to compute like what is the policy that the other players are going to play, given that this message um, has been sent, and then is that better than not sending the message or? or I feel like that's how my brain works too. Like there's a language model that generates random crap, and then there's these other neural nets that later the, the filter network comes in and says no uh -huh. no that's not funny at all that, i mean there's some something interesting to that kind of process so you have a set of actions that you you want you have an intent that you want to achieve an intent that you want your opponent to achieve then you generate messages and then you evaluate if those messages will achieve the t the the. Um, uh, then we'll generate messages that are just like totally nonsense, um, and we try to filter those out. We also try to filter out messages that that are basically lies. Um, so you know, diplomacy has this reputation as a game that's really about um, deception and lying, mm -hmm. but we try to actually minimize the amount that the bot would lie. Um, this was actually mostly a- Or are you? Would make the bot perform worse in the long run. It would end up with a lower score because once the bot lies- um, Diplomacy players, what they'll tell you is that diplomacy is a game about trust and being able to build trust in an environment that encourages people to not trust anyone. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the ultimate tension in diplomacy. How can this AI reason about whether you are being honest in your communication, and how can the AI persuade you that it is being honest when it is telling you that, hey, I'm actually going to support you this turn? Is there some sense, I don't know if you step back and think that this process will indirectly help us study human psychology so like if trust is the ultimate goal wouldn't that help us understand what are the fundamental aspects of forming trust between humans and between humans and ai i mean that's a really really important question that's much bigger than than strategy games is how can that that's fundamental to the human robot interaction problem how do we form trust between intelligent entities so one of the things I'm really excited about with diplomacy, um, there's never really been a good domain to investigate these kinds of questions. Yeah. Um, and diplomacy gives us a domain where trust is really at the center of it. Um, and it's not just like you've hired a bunch of mechanical Turkers that you know, are being paid and trying to go through the task as quickly as possible. You have these people that are really invested in the outcome of the game, and they're really trying to do the, the best that they can. Um, and so I'm really excited that we're able to, we, we actually like have put together this, we're open sourcing all of our models, we're open sourcing uh, all, of the, all of the code, and we're making the data that we've used available to researchers um, so that they can investigate these kinds of questions. <laughs> messages and the filtering yeah not not just even the data of the ai playing with the humans but all the training data that we that we had that we used to train the ai to understand how humans play the game we're setting up a system where researchers will be able to apply um to be able to gain access to that data and be able to to use it in their own research we should say what is the name of the system we're calling the bot cicero cicero and what's the name like the, you're open sourcing, what's the name of the repository and and the like the the project? Is it also just called Cicero, the big project? Um, or are you still coming up with a name? The the data set comes from this website, webdiplomacy.net, is this site that's been online for like 20 years now. And uh, it's one of the main sites that people use to play diplomacy on it. 
We've got like 50,000 games of diplomacy with, you know, natural language communication, um, over 10 million messages. So it's a pretty massive data set that people can use to, um, we're hoping that the, the academic community, the research community is able to use it for, for all sorts of interesting research questions. Maybe the best data set that I can think of out there to, to investigate these kinds of questions of um, negotiation, trust, um, persuasion. Um, I wouldn't say it's the best data set in the world for um, human AI interaction. That's a very broad field, but I think that it's definitely up there is like, you know, if, if you're really interested in language models interacting with humans in, you know, a setting where their incentives are not fully aligned, this seems like an ideal. <laughs> Well, I think there's ideas or results. Yeah, I think there's a few aspects of the results and um, that that I think are really exciting. So, first of all, the fact that we were able to achieve such strong performance, um, I was surprised by and pleasantly surprised by. Um, So, we played 40 games of diplomacy with real humans, and the bot placed second out of all players that have played five or more games. So, it's about 80 players total. Um, 19 of whom played five or more games and the bot was ranked second out of those players. Um, and the bot was, was really good in two dimensions. One being able to establish strong connections with the other players on the board, being able to like persuade them to work with it, um, being able to coordinate with them about like how it's going to work with them. And then also the raw tactical and strategic aspects of the game, you know, being able to understand what the other players are likely to do, being able to model their behavior and respond appropriately to that, the bot also really excelled at. What are some interesting things that the bot said? By the way, are you allowed to swear in the, um, like are there rules to what you're allowed to say and not in diplomacy? You can say whatever you want. I think the site will get very angry at you if you start like threatening somebody. And <laughs> we actually- or, like if you threaten somebody, you, you're supposed to do it politely. Yeah, politely. You know, like keep it in character. Um, the, <laughs> the bot, we actually had a researcher watching the bot 24 seven for, well, whenever we play a game, we had a bot watching it to make sure that it wouldn't go off the rails and start like threatening. strategies would emerge there have you seen anything interesting that you huh that's a weird that's a that's a weird behavior either of the filter or the, or the language model that was weird to you that was yeah there were definitely like things that the bot would would do that were not in line with like how humans would approach the game and that in, in a good way the humans actually you know we we've talked <laughs> for? Well, I, I think you're asking kind of two questions there. So one, like modeling the irrationality and the suboptimality of, of humans. Um, you can't, in diplomacy, you can't treat all the other players like they're machines. And if you do that, you're you're going to end up playing really poorly. And so we actually ran this experiment. So we, we trained a bot in a two-player zero-sum version of diplomacy um, the same way that you might approach a game. Your personality to each player, and then you're supposed to remember that. But what do you mean it's not able to understand uh, the players? Well, it would, for example, expect the human to support it in a certain way when the human would simply like think like, no, I'm not supposed to support you here. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if you develop a self-driving car, This is an aspect of, of two-player zero-sum versus games that involve cooperation. So in a two-player zero-sum game, uh, you can do self-play from scratch and you will arrive at the Nash equilibrium where you don't have to worry about the other player playing in a very human suboptimal style. That's just going to be that the only way that deviating from a Nash equilibrium um, would, would change things is if it helped you. So I... What's the dynamic of cooperation that's effective in diplomacy? Got it. And 
boy, and the the lying comes into play there. So the the more friends you have, the better. Yeah, I mean, I guess you have to attack somebody, or else you're not going to make progress. All right, so that's the tension. But man, this is too real. <laughs> this is too real. To, this is too too close to geo geopolitics of actual military conflict in the world. Okay, uh, that's fascinating. So that cooperation element is what makes the game really really hard. Yeah. And to give you an, an, like an example of, of how this suboptimality and irrationality comes into play, there's a really common situation in a game of diplomacy um, that where one player starts to win and they're like at the point. Yeah. Show where like, you know, you got the, the others coming from the north and like all the people have to start, you work out their differences and stop them from, from taking over. Um, and the bot will do this. The, the bot will work with the other players to stop the superpower from winning. But if it doesn't really, if it's trained from scratch or it doesn't really have a good grounding in how humans approach it, it will also at the same time attack the other players with its extra units. Mm -hmm. So all the units that are not necessary to stop the superpower from winning, it will use those to grab as many centers as possible from the other players. And in totally rational play, the other players should just live with that. You know, they have to understand like, hey, a score of one is better than a score of zero. So, um, so okay, he's grabbed my centers, but I, I'll just deal with it. But humans don't act that way, right? The human gets really angry at the bot and ends up throwing the game because, you know, I'm going to screw you over because you did something that's not fair to me. Got it. And uh, are you supposed to model that? Is the bot supposed to model that kind of human frustration yeah that's actually one of the major challenges that we faced in the research that we had a good amount of human data we had about 50,000 games what we try to do is leverage as much self play as possible while still um, leveraging the human data um, so what we do is we do self play um, very similar to how it's been done in poker and go but we try to regularize the self-play towards the human data. Basically, the way to think about it is um, we penalize the bot for choosing. On the internet, that's useful besides just diplomacy. So on the language side of things, is there some, can you go to like Reddit and, <laughs> um, so sort of background model formulation that, that's useful for the game of diplomacy. Yeah, absolutely. And so for the language model, which um, is kind of like a separate question, you know, we didn't use the language model during self-play training, but we pre-trained the language model on, you know, tons of internet data um, as much as possible. And then we fine tuned it specifically on the diplomacy games. So we are able to like leverage the wider data set in order to uh, fill in some of the gaps in like how communication happens more broad. Whether somebody is lying or not, but what it will do is try to predict what actions they're going to take given the communications, given the messages that they've sent to us. So given our conversation, what do I think you're going to do? And implicitly there is a calculation about whether you're lying to me in that, you know, if, if you're, Based on your messages, if I think you're going to attack me this turn, um, even though your messages say that you're not, then you know essentially the bot is predicting that you're lying. But it doesn't view it as as lying the same way that we would view it as lying. But you could probably reformulate with all the same data and make a classifier lying or not. Yeah, I think I think you could do that. Um, that was not something that we were focused on, but I think that it is possible that. You know, if you came up with some measurements of like, what does it mean to tell a lie? Because there's there's a spectrum, right? Like, feels like an argument inside a relationship now. <laughs> <laughs> what constitutes a lie? Um, depends what you mean by the definition of the word is. Okay. Um, still, it's fascinating because trust and lying is all intermixed into this. And it's language models that are becoming more and more sophisticated. It's just a fascinating space to explore. Mm -hmm. um, 
what 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 do you see i i think really what it's showing us is the potential that language models have i mean i think a lot of people didn't think that this kind of result was possible even today despite all the progress that's been made in language models and, and so it shows us how we can leverage the power of things like self play on top of language models to get um increasingly better performance. And um, the ceiling is really much higher than what we have right now. Is this transferable somehow to to chatbots for the more general task of dialogue? So because there is a kind of negotiation here, a dance between entities that are trying to cooperate and at the same time, a little bit adversarial, which I think maps somewhat to the general, you know, the entire process of Reddit <laughs> or like internet communication. You're cooperating, you're adversarial, you're having debates, you're having uh, camaraderie, all that kind of stuff. I think one of the things that's really useful about diplomacy is that we have a well-defined value function. There is a, a well-defined score that the bot is right. trying to optimize. and and. In a in a setting like a general chatbot setting, it needs it would need that kind of um, objective in order to fully leverage the techniques that we've developed. What about like what we talked about earlier with NPCs inside video games? How like, how can it be used to create uh, for Elder Scrolls Six more compelling um, NPCs? that you could talk to instead of instead of committing all kinds of violence with a sword and fighting dragons, just sitting in a tavern and drink all day and talk to the chatbot. The way that we've approached AI and diplomacy is you condition the language on an intent. Now that intent in diplomacy is an is an action, but it doesn't have to be. And you can imagine, you know, you could have NPCs in video games or the metaverse or whatever where there's some intent or there's some objective that they're trying to maximize and you can specify what that is. Um, and, and then the language can correspond to that intent. Now I'm not saying that this is, you know, happening imminently, but, um, I'm saying that this is like a future application potentially of this direction of research. So what's the more general formulation of this making self play, be able to scale the way self play does and still maintain human like behavior. The way that we've, approach self-play in diplomacy is like we're we're trying to come up with good intents to condition the language model on and the space of intents is actions that can be played in the game now there is like the potential to have a broader set of intents things like you know long-term cooperation or long-term uh objectives or you know gossip about <laughs> say like, oh, you should be talking about this thing right now. But it's quite possible that you could expand the scope of intents to be able to allow it to talk about those things. Now, in the process of doing that, the self-play would become much more complicated. Um, and so that is a potential for, for future work. Okay, the increase in the number of intents. I still am not quite clear how you keep the self-play integrated into the human world. Yeah. I'm I'm a little bit loose on the you know, particularly high expected value. Um, but it would have to be a really high expected value in order to to deviate from from this human like policy. So you basically say try to maximize your expected value while at the same time stay as close as possible to the human policy. And there is a parameter that controls those the the relative weighting of those competing objectives. So the question I have is how sophisticated can the anchor policy get? To have a policy that approximates human behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you increase the number of intents, as you generalize the the space in which this is uh, applicable, and given that the human data is limited, try to anticipate a policy that works for in a much larger number of cases. Like how, how difficult is the process of, of forming a damn good? 
the major bottleneck in yeah. in scaling to to more complicated um, domains. But that said, you know there might be the potential, just like in the language model where we leveraged you know tons of data on the internet and then specialized it for diplomacy. Um, there is the future potential that you can leverage huge amounts of data across the board, and then specialize it in the data set that you have for diplomacy. And in that way, you're essentially augmenting the amount of data that you have. To what degree does this apply to the gen? Well, like I said, the original motivation for the game of diplomacy was the failures of World War I, the diplomatic failures that led to war. Uh Um, the way that I see it, war is an inherently negative sum game, right? There's always a better outcome than war for all the parties involved. And my hope is that, you know, as AI progresses, then maybe this technology could be used to help people make better decisions um, across the board and, you know, hopefully avoid negative sum outcomes like war. Yeah, I, would I mean, I just came back from Ukraine. I'm going back there uh, on deep personal levels. Think a lot about. But and the hope is that in the long run, we'll be able to get there. Yeah, but see, diplomacy feels like closer to the real world than does StarCraft. Like, because it's natural language, right? Absolutely. You're you're operating in the space of intents and in the space of natural language. That feels very close to the real world. And it also feels like you could get data on that mm -hmm. from the internet. Yeah, and that's why I do think that diplomacy is taking a big step closer to the real world than anything that's came before in terms of game AI breakthroughs. The fact that, you know, we're we're communicating in natural language, we've we're leveraging the fact that we have this like general data set uh, of uh, dialogue and, and communication from a breadth of the internet. Um, that is that is a big step in that direction. We're not 100% there, but um, but we're getting closer at least. So if we actually return back to poker and chess, are some of the ideas that you're learning here with diplomacy, could you construct AI systems that play like humans? Like, um, make for a fun opponent in a game of chess? Yeah, absolutely. We've already started looking into this direction a bit. So we tried to use the techniques that we've developed for diplomacy uh, to make chess and Go AIs. And what we found is that it led to much more human-like strong... ...supervised learning on those games. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that if you do that, what you end up with is an AI that's substantially weaker than the human grandmasters that you've trained on. Because um, it's not able to approximate those details very effectively. And on the other hand, you can leverage search and planning very heavily, but then what you end up with is an AI that plays in a very different style from how humans play the game. Now, if you strike this intermediate balance by setting the, um, the regularization parameters correctly and say you can do planning, but try to keep it close to the human policy, then you end up with an AI that plays in both a very human-like style and a very strong uh, style. And the things that I was thinking about is, and this is actually already being done, I think there's a researcher at the University of Toronto that's working on this, um, is to make an AI that plays in the style of a particular player. Like Magnus Carlsen, for example, you can make an AI that plays like Magnus Carlsen. And then where I think this gets interesting is like, hey, maybe you're up against Magnus Carlsen in the world championship or something. You can play against this Magnus Carlsen bot to prepare against the real Magnus Carlsen. And you can try to explore strategies that he might struggle with um, and try to figure out like, how do you beat this player in particular? Um, on the other hand, you can also have Magnus Carlsen working with this bot to try to figure out where he's weak um, and where he needs to improve his strategy. Um, and so I can envision this future where data on specific chess and Go players becomes extremely valuable because you can use that data. 
detection much harder. It it does, yeah. The way that cheat detection works in a game like poker and a game like chess and go, from what I understand, is trying to see like is this person challenges for cheat detection. And it makes you now ask yourself a hard question about what is the role of AI systems as they become more and more integrated in our society. And this kind of human AI um integration has has some deep ethical issues that we should be aware of and also it's a kind of cybersecurity challenge right for to make you know w one of the assumptions we have when we play games is that there's a trust that it's only humans exciting but then we have to have the defenses better and better and better if we're to trust that we uh can enjoy you know for example right now it's really hard to learn how to get better in games like chess and poker and go because the way that the ai plays is so foreign and incomprehensible yes. yeah. but if you have these ais that are playing you know you can say like oh i'm a 2000 elo human how do i get to 2200 mm -hmm. now you can have an ai that plays in the style of a 2200 elo human and that will help you get better mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot, a lot of upside potential too. And I think, you know, with any sort of tool, there's, there's the potential for a lot of greatness and a lot of uh, downsides as well. So in the paper that I got a chance to look at, there's a section on uh, ethical considerations. What's in that section? This is the Lex Free Podcast.